So hello to you all. My name is Ashley Burns, and I am honored to serve as DAV's Deputy National Communications Director. On behalf of DAV and Camp Corral, um, I'd like to welcome all of you to this special military and veterans children's caregiver seminar presented in conjunction with Camp Corral to talk about some of the things that military and veteran children caregivers want you to know about their role, their responsibility, and their resiliency. So as a combat veteran and a mother myself, I can state unequivocally that the issues that are going to be discussed today with such long-term and wide-ranging ramifications can only be solved through collaboration and a multi-approach. This seminar will bring much-needed awareness to the issues at hand with perspectives from experts in caregiver wellness, disabled veterans, and perhaps most importantly from caregiver kids of military veterans themselves. In partnership with DAV, Camp Corral provides free, one-of-a-kind summer camp experiences for children aged 8 to 15 whose parents are wounded, disabled, or have fallen in military service. The organization partners with accredited community entities that offer traditional camp experiences through activities like horseback riding, canoeing, rock climbing, all those camp things that you do as a kid, giving these children a chance to connect with other kids who come from similar circumstances. A feature that's unique to the Camp Corral, Camp Corral experience is that a military family life counselor uh, is on site to work with campers as they, as they need it. To date, Camp Corral has served over 24,000 children from military families. And through DAV's Just Be Kids scholarship program, more than 4,500 children of wounded, disabled, or fallen veterans throughout the nation have attended Camp Corral programs completely for free. We are grateful for Camp Corral's partnership with DAV throughout all the years that we've worked together. DAV is deeply committed to continuing our work with Camp Corral to generate awareness, strengthen policies in this area, and to catalyze cross-sector collaboration in partnership with you and other organizations. Because if we work together, if we bring together all of our various skills and expertise, influence, and advocacy, will have a much greater impact in supporting caregivers and disabled veterans alike. Too often, the voices of caregiver kids can get lost in the waves of responsibility that befall a family of someone who has become seriously, seriously disabled. And some of you here with us today may have experienced that yourselves in your own families. Um, but now I think what I'd really like to do, and it is my honor and privilege to kick off the seminar, seminar with a video that's going to help us amplify those voices. So without further ado. Welcome to this course on 15 things military and veterans kids want you to know. Our families are a lot like other families. Deployments are really hard for us. We understand why our parents serve. Military kids miss their parents when they're deployed, no matter how long they're away. Sometimes families know in advance about a deployment. Other times, parents can be called away unexpectedly for lots of reasons, and there is not much time to prepare and say goodbye. This is definitely the case with National Guard parents who might be called away to help in an emergency. Regardless of the circumstance, military youth say, despite how much they miss their mom or dad, they understand the reasons for his or her absence from their family. Compared to their non-military peers, children of active duty families have a deeper understanding of the concept of serving something larger than yourself. They know their parents signed up to protect their country, and in doing so, protect them and all of us. Even at a young age, they understand how important this is, and that their parents' service matters very much to the people of America. They have a unique comprehension of the word hero and how it means making a sacrifice for the good of something or someone else. Sometimes, our parents are different when they come home. A lot of military and veterans' children don't have a lot of details about what their active duty parents experience during deployments. What they do know is that sometimes mom or dad comes home looking the same but acting differently. Other times, if they've experienced a physical injury, they may look different as well, or they might not be able to participate in activities the same way they used to. The children of veterans may live in a house where a loved one has experienced trauma or has enduring injuries. They can be confusing for military kids. 
and can require adjustment for the whole family. Resources are offered by the military or in the community, like family or individual counseling, or events for military kids to help children manage their adjustment to visible and invisible injuries in their parents. Moving around makes it hard to make and keep friends. Other military kids understand what we've been through. The military family lifestyle is unique and presents certain challenges. However, for most military kids, even very stressful situations or unique circumstances can feel normal. It's just the way it is in their households. Deployments, moving to and going to schools in different states or foreign countries, and being far away from family and friends are just a few of the experiences military kids share. Finding ways to connect with other military and veterans kids can help to normalize their feelings about this and provide an outlet for stress. After all, there's nothing quite like talking to someone who knows what you're going through. We deal with complicated feelings. Military kids often experience a lot of conflicting emotions. They're proud of their parents' service and happy to be a part of something that matters so much to their parents. But as they grow and learn more about their parents' jobs, they develop an understanding about the dangers he or she might face. They often live with unspoken fear that something will happen to their parents, especially when they're far away in another part of the world. The conflicting emotions occur partly because of the culture of the military, one that values bravery, selflessness, and teamwork, gets translated to the children of active duty service members in these situations. Without anyone specifically telling them to, military and veterans' kids can feel ashamed to be afraid. They want to be brave like their parents are and make their parents proud of their courage. Many times, this leads to military children keeping a lot of their complex feelings about their family to themselves. Sometimes, we don't want to talk about it. Military and veterans' kids want to be treated like other kids, regardless of the fact that their parents wore the country's uniform. A small percentage of Americans have ever served in the military, and even fewer are currently serving on active duty. You can imagine this means that for military kids, they often find themselves in situations where people don't know what life is like for them or their family. Quite simply, military kids say they sometimes just don't want to talk about it or explain it. Military kids also want those other people in their lives to understand they are not responsible for, nor do they understand military decisions that affect their family directly. And please don't ask military kids about their parents' combat experience or exactly what their parents did while deployed. For many reasons, the details of these deployments are often not shared with children, and non-military people who mean well should not ask about them. We might have more responsibilities at home. We might be caregivers to our parents. Some military and veteran children take on responsibility of providing care for a parent who is injured, ill, or wounded in service. Sometimes, wounds to the veteran parent are visible, like amputations or blindness, while others can be invisible, like toxic exposures, traumatic brain injuries, or post-traumatic stress. Wounds people can see are easy to explain, but invisible wounds are much more difficult for children to explain and for others to understand. For instance, military kids with an injured or ill veteran parent may have some unique challenges socially. Responsibilities at home can take up a lot of time, so the ability to spend time with friends might be limited. Again, this is hard for military youth to explain to their peers, so often they don't try. In addition to household chores that other kids are responsible for, military caregivers might help their parent with additional activities of daily living, such as helping a parent with eating, bathing, or taking medication. Finally, some of the ordinary everyday activities that other families might enjoy might cause a lot of anxiety for families that include a disabled veteran parent. Like any other major life event in a family unit, Living with an ill or injured parent is a big change for a kid. Even more so for a military kid who has endured uncertainty that comes with deployments and constant transitions that are part of the military lifestyle. A child with a wounded, ill, or injured parent often experiences a lot of difficult emotions. 
These might be similar to those felt by the rest of the family, except military kids might not have the words to express themselves or feel comfortable doing so. It's important to know military kids are resilient. With support and encouragement from a trusted adult, military caregiving youth can learn to talk about their emotions and identify caregiving tasks they can do to help the whole family. Sometimes we just want to be like everyone else. There are advantages to being a military kid. These kids are resilient. Kids who grow up in non-military, non-veteran households probably can't understand many of the stressors and obstacles that kids in military and veteran communities face. As we've discussed, the constant change, unpredictability, and worry that often comes with a military lifestyle can be tough for young people to navigate. And yet, most of them do an amazing job at it and grow up to be really flexible adults who are good at problem solving and interacting with a wide variety of different people and cultures. Adapting to change is something military kids learn at an early age. This develops self-efficacy and the knowledge that you have the skills to cope with something new and resilience, which is the ability to overcome stressful situations. And since we know that resilience is stronger in children who grow up knowing they belong to a close-knit community where they're understood, supported, and cared for, military kids have a leg up. After all, the military and veteran family is considered much larger than those in the household. It extends to the entire community, which prides itself on taking care of each other. We're proud of our parents' service. We serve too. When one person in the family serves our country, the whole family serves. Parents on active duty or hospitalized veterans may have to miss first steps, birthdays, sporting events, dance recitals and plays, parent-teacher conferences, helping with homework, and other milestones in their children's lives. Many of these families, however, are really good at finding unique and creative ways to celebrate together despite conflicting obligations or disabilities. For example, military families may record special events to watch later with their children, or delay in serving holidays, birthdays, and milestones until the serving parents can be there. Military youth learn that days on the calendar are not as important as being together to celebrate or share meaningful connections. Regardless of the way this plays out in a military family, there is no question that the children of that family also serve their country. They make sacrifices that can be really difficult, all for something more important than themselves. Thank you so much for taking the time to take this course about military kids and how their lives are unique, challenging, and really special. We hope we have given you a better understanding about the best way to interact with and support the military youth in your life. A special thanks to the military kids who provided the answers that became the 15 things, as well as those who allowed us to use photos of them and their families throughout the course. And a special thanks to DAV, Disabled American Veterans, for making this possible and supporting Camp Corral's efforts to help military and veteran children just be kids. Also, the 
Military Spouse of the Year for the past two years from North Carolina. I live in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I'm an active duty military spouse. I am the daughter of a Vietnam veteran, Army Aviator, and I'm the mother of an infantryman. So he kind of went a different route. I have a husband and a father who are Army Aviators and a son who decided he was going to go infantry. Um, we didn't make him the black sheep of the family, but we're still talking to him about it. Um, so I, I kind of have a perspective of uh, what my family's lived experience has been from what the 800,000 plus uh, veterans and military connected family members in North Carolina tell us, as well as my husband just changed out of command from the 82nd Combat Aviation Brigade, 82nd Airborne Division, so about 9,000 other service members and family members, and a lot of what I've heard from them and what we hear at Camp Corral echo, and we hear a lot of the same things from you at DAV. Uh, the mission of Camp Corral is to transform the lives of these children of our nation's military uh, heroes, our wounded, ill, and fallen service members. And each year we do ask thousands of the children who participate in our camps, and Ashley mentioned a number earlier uh, this, this afternoon, it's actually grown. We've served almost 30,000 children since our inception in 2011. We're celebrating our 10th anniversary at Camp Corral, and we provide summer camp, which I think a lot of you are very familiar with that because you support us through your efforts with DAV. We also provide advocacy and year-round enrichment and holistic programs for these children and their family members. And each year we ask them questions. And a couple of years ago, we asked them the question, what do you children want others to know about what it's like to live the life of a military child? What is it like to be in a military connected family? And we had, as you can imagine, many various responses. And what you saw today was the compilation of those top 15 responses. And I think that they hit home with the many of you. I was looking around the audience as the video was playing. And I saw heads nodding, I saw agreement, I saw understanding um, and awareness, and we want to bring this awareness to communities outside of the military connected community. So we are going to be using this video, which um, was developed with DAV in partnership with DAV. Uh, we're going to be using this as an educational resource for communities to support organizations for schools. Um, you know, think of boys and girls clubs, YMCA's, all of these different types of extracurricular activities where we have military connected children involved in those communities to kind of bring awareness and advocacy on their behalf. So thank you all for helping us to amplify and elevate their voices. And speaking of voices today, I'd like to go ahead and turn Panelist. I'm going to ask each of you, if you will, to introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then also, if you will, tell us one word, watching that video, what is the first word that comes to your mind? We'll start right here, Good afternoon, my name is Isabella Taft, I am 22 years old, and I am the daughter of a Navy corpsman. He was in the Navy for 20 years. And I was very lucky to be a participant in one of the first Camp Corral sessions. So, and to me, this video was just very honest. Everything they're saying, I could relate to, and it's really amazing to see that it's getting out there. Thank you. Hi, I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Clary Tapp. Uh, I'm 16 years old. My dad, my sister, so my dad was also in the Navy for 20 years. Um, I have been attending Camp Crow camps for eight years, so since I was eight years old. Huh? And whenever I was watching that video and seeing the pictures and videos from Camp Crow, it just reminded me of all the friends that I've made and the friendships that um, have definitely been made at these camps uh, between military kids. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Taft. Um, I am the granddaughter of a World War II vet, the daughter of the wife of a post 9 11 vet, and that video to me um, humbled because we are finally at a point in time where we can start talking about the children. Hi, good afternoon. Um, we're the Navy Long Road. We were married about 10 years and they came in here. Our children were 9, 7, and 1. I'm uh, 
PNC, Dave Riley. Uh, I was Army and Coast Guard, and uh, also a military brat. So uh, we got to kind of experience all, all aspects of this. Um, so the one word uh, that comes to me, uh, there's a lot of loneliness. Uh, uh, being a military, uh, military brat and uh, being deployed. I think, I think that a lot of people can actually relate to quite a bit of what you're talking about, Dave. Let's go ahead, and if you will, I'd like to hear from the Rileys. Um, the video talked about that the changes that kids may identify with when a parent comes home wounded. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the experience was in your household when you came home wounded? What was that like for, for you, for the children? Oh, it's completely different. I remember our son saying right before they got sick that dad could do anything, but when he came home, and it was uh, a lot of learning process. I mean, you see him walking, and, and it, it was a lot of learning process when he first came out. Um, life just changed completely, from being very active to our lives kind of revolved around us, and for a little while, until we adjusted, it was a lot of adjustment. So uh, when I was still in the hospital, uh, I remember my son didn't even want to come see me because uh, I had lost my limbs and everything, and he just uh, didn't want to see me. And uh, so it's a uh, it was a long process, and then, you know I was going through changes for uh, at the same time. And, uh, it was very difficult for many years uh, getting adjusted. I think uh, they are stronger now for have gone through the experience and uh, uh, they've grown up all to be good children. Yeah. And, and so looking back on that, obviously you said that there was a lot of challenges. What types of supports that do you see that are in place now that maybe were not then that you wish maybe your children had the opportunity to have those resources or supports? And what's out, not out there now that might have been helpful that you kind of had to figure out on your own? Well, I don't think we ever said we're a caregiver when, when you got sick. And we never thought to ask the children. You know, we just adjusted and tried to keep their lives as normal as possible by doing church and their sports and dancing. Um, we never thought to ask them how they were feeling. There was no counseling or anything back then. It's a different world now. It, it is a different world. I'm curious, out here in our audience, you brought up a really good point. How many of you have actually heard of or are familiar with the fact that we have children who are performing caregiving duties in households, taking on those responsibilities? Right, uh, just a handful. So it is, this is something that Camp Corral is working with more and more because it's just like you said, we don't believe that um, there is that level of awareness out there, but the reality is, is that children are taking on roles as caregivers. They're doing well beyond just what your normal chores are, right? We want our children to do chores and take on responsibilities in the household. But this is over and beyond. So when we're talking about caregiving roles that these children are taking on, especially in the households where they have a wounded or an ill um, service member or a veteran parent, we're talking about over and beyond the normal chores and activities and duties. We know at Camp Corral, right at 70% of the children who are attending our summer camps this year are taking on caregiver roles, at least one caregiver role in their household. Um, with that in mind, Amy, I know you have a lot to say about some changes in that um, bringing about awareness of children as caregivers. Can you tell us a little bit about why you're so adamant about bringing that awareness and what that personal meaning is for you and your daughters? Absolutely. Um, so I think it's wonderful that we're starting to use this word caregiver and children uh, because of the fact that these children are being asked, like you said, to take on roles and responsibilities above their own. Um, it's making them grow up a whole lot faster than their peers. It's isolating them. Whenever you have a pre-adolescent 
All they want to do is be like the person next door. But these are children who are having to take on tasks such as baiting a parent. As an adult, and whenever you have to bait your parent, it can be humbling. Imagine being a 10, 11, 12 year old child that has to give your parent a bath. Imagine being the parent that has to receive that bath from the 10, 11, 12 year old and how those dynamics can easily change. So they're not only having to take on the responsibility, they're also having to battle this constant role of being a kid. And how do they keep that relationship even killed? You know, whenever you're having to take on these extra responsibilities, how do you take on a responsibility for your parent one day, and then the next day have your same parent lecture you about seeing them as the, the force to listen to? You know, as the person to listen to, and as the person that's going to give them wisdom, and the person that's going to, you know, direct their life for the rest of the year. So there's this constant battle that's going on in their head. Are they the person that's supposed to be giving the care, or are they the person that's supposed to be receiving the care? And the answer is yes to both. And so, like, me as a spouse, it took me years. My husband was entered in um, 2010. It was probably not until about 2013, 2014, that I realized how to be a spouse and a caregiver. I can't imagine at the age of 5 and 12, whenever their father was entered, what it was like to have to fight that same battle of how am I supposed to listen to this person as my parent and be the person responsible for providing the care. So I think we need to just be very adamant about recognizing their role in the family, recognizing that they're going through some of these same battles, that they are having to do this, and then also add on the peer groups, how their peers react to this, how the isolation happens with them because they don't want people to come over to their house and see this part of their life. And I think that's a great point, is um, it's hard to talk about. Um, and we've been talking about what it's like for you. I'd like to hear from Clara and, and Isabella. What is that like? like we're, talking, we're, we're talking about words like isolation, like loneliness. We're also talking about the need for connection. Can you tell us a little bit about what your experiences have been? Of course. Um, so I mentioned earlier how this video was very honest for me and for us. Um, I don't want to speak for her. <laughs> um, but we, you do get become very isolated and alone. And um, as my mom mentioned, at 12, 13 years old, you just want to be like everybody else and fit in and not have anything wrong. You, you want to be normal. And so for us, um, or at least for me, I think the biggest adjustment was in that middle school age, you want to have birthday parties, you want to have bonfires, friends over. I didn't want my friends over. My dad has a right to drink, um, and so I didn't want him to have an explosive moment from the overstimulation of that, and my friends see that, and then them alienate me and not want to be, you know, hang out with me or spend that time with me because of my dad. Um, another part of that, too, kind of from a sisterly side, so there's seven years between us, um, and I kind of had to help my mom take on the responsibility of not only my dad, but also my sister, because there were times whenever my mom needed to take care of my dad because it wasn't something that I could do, and she would be, we would need dinner, and so I would have to help cook dinner or help her with homework, and so um, we kind of have a bond that's a little bit different than just a sisterly bond because we walked through that together. Um, even to this day, there are things that will happen at home and um, she won't be able to talk to mom or dad, but I know that she'll talk to me because we know what each other has gone through and that's something that neither of our parents can understand. And I think that's something so amazing about Camp Corral and everything that they do is they give you that peer connection so you're not isolated and lonely anymore. You have people and you know it's a safe environment because everybody in that environment has a parent that has some kind of injury. And so being at the camp, I found that it was the place that I could really open up and it was the first place that I was able to open up and really start talking about everything that I had experienced. And, and I think that's a great point because you were surrounded by others who get it, who, although they may not have the exact same experience, 
they can understand your experience. You don't want to even have to talk about it. You just get to be a kid. Um, so Claire, I'd like to hear from you what advice you might have for other children who could be listening in who want to make those peer connections but aren't quite sure how to go about doing that. We know it's important, so how would you advise them? Um, so I was five whenever he was diagnosed with a brain injury, so I've kind of grown up knowing my dad as he is and having to learn how to make friends um, who also have, like, who can make, oh, sorry, who can make connections with, who have also been in the military, like, who have military parents. And it's just getting involved and having to talk to people. So getting into Golden uh, Camp Corral and being able to find people who are like you to communicate and be able to express yourself more. Um, because they understand, and even going, like, bringing some of that to school, being able to be like, oh, you said that your dad was in the military, let's be friends, let's talk about it, let's be someone we can lean on. Um, you know, if our parent is having a bad day, we can always call each other or text each other and be like, hey, like, this is what's happening, I should have been really quickly. Like, um, <laughs> it's just something that we need as kids is someone to lean on, and um, being able to find an area of um, <laughs> being able to find someone that we can lean on in our age is a whole lot easier than finding a parent uh, or an older uh, person in that matter to lean on. So um, definitely getting involved in your community, in your military community, in your school, in any way you can with the military. It's, that's a lot easier. Great advice. Thank you for that. That's really good advice. It's just that getting involvement, and sometimes there's so much strength in being vulnerable, right? And it's you're allowing yourself to be vulnerable, and you receive the benefit of that by, you know, and being stronger and showing others the opportunity to be that. Um, I'm curious to hear from the parents down there. We've talked a lot about caregiving, so Amy, Vaughn, Dave, whoever would like to answer. We do know that more and more children, especially these military children are kind of um, taking on more of these caregiver responsibilities. And we hear from parents often that they don't realize that their child is actually a caregiver. They don't use that word, that terminology. <coughs> Many times children don't realize that what they're doing is providing caregiving responsibilities. They just kind of slide into that role. A little bit here one day, a little bit more one day. So could you please whichever of you would like to answer, all of you. Um, share with us how you've seen your children take on a role as a caregiver and maybe provide some suggestions to other parents who might be listening in on how to support their children and how to recognize when their children are taking on caregiving roles. Well, we just, uh, we, we have a one-year-old, so they obviously had to uh, follow her around while I was helping David. but they did end up giving, do helping him plug things in, um, a cup of iced tea. You just do what you have to on a daily basis. But like I said, they have as much time as they could live their normal lives outside of the house, they still have a normal life. So, I mean, that's just part of life. You have to come together as a family and, and make it work. You know, uh, I, I give all the credit to Yvonne and my kids for uh, putting up with me for all those years because it was pretty rough for many years. And, uh, uh, but we kind of figured out a way to keep on going and uh, come together and help each other out. Uh, you know, I was able to go to more sports with them and uh, different things because I really didn't have uh, a lot to do. And, uh, you know, so it was tough at first learning how to communicate, learning uh, what things I would need uh, to just to survive every day. And, uh, you know, they did such a good job at adapting, um, um, you know, and, and it must have been good for them because both my daughters are nurses now, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think for us, um, like you said, that we have a saying in our house that we, we honestly think that the military slogan needs to be, it is what it is, because we find ourselves saying that so many times. 
it is what it is, you've got to keep on going. Um, and so I think for us, or the, the advice I would give now looking back, is helping your children find that balance, um, keeping them involved in their activities, finding ways to keep them involved in their activities they find. For Clara, it's a softball field. You'll see her softball with her wherever she's at because that, that's her comfort. That's where she can be a kid, and it's 100% kid. Um, for Bella, it was dance um, or, or twirling or black with the color guard. And, and just giving them those outlets to, to do what they need to do to be 100% kid. And then as far as the caregiving goes, um, knowing when to draw the boundaries so that they can be a kid. And, and that's one of the things I wish I would have probably taken on early on was knowing when enough was enough. It was great. My husband forgot how to tie his shoes. She was five. Guess what she was learning how to do? Tie her shoes. So she had a lot of practice. She tied a lot of pairs of boots um, whenever, whenever her dad was in her to put tie his shoes. And then we were teaching them both at the same time. So it, it worked. Um, there's been a lot of things that we taught them at the same time to do again. And so you just kind of plug them in and let them do it. Um, and then now that they're older, I think um, the lesson that we learned from Isabella is teaching her that it's okay to spread her own wings and, and that we're going to be okay. Um, we live in North Carolina. She just moved down to Orlando a month ago to take on her job. We were super proud of her because for us, she finally learned the lesson that she could spread her own wings and be her own person. We were going to be okay, and she could go do what she wanted to do. And, and that's what all parents want for their children, right? To be able to be independent and confident enough to take on their their own lives as well. And one thing that Amy that you said that struck me is boundaries, that it's important to create boundaries for your children. What do you mean by that? How did you go about setting those boundaries and how do you determine what those boundaries should be? So we have a couple of boundaries in our house. The first one that we had to teach was personal boundaries. Uh, my husband has a moderate brain injury, most of that's in the frontal lobe, which means he has absolutely no filter at all. Um, anything can be said at any point in time in any tone. And so we had to set boundaries and we had to teach these kids that it was okay to tell dad that, hey, you stepped into my lane and I need you to take a step back. That was huge getting them to vocalize that and to be able to give them that boundary of personal space and respect because sometimes he loses that and it's not his fault. He doesn't mean to do it, but whatever. You don't have a frontal lobe, it just goes straight over the top sometimes. Um, and then the second one was the boundaries and roles of the family. And it's okay to be a caregiver. It's okay to put on some responsibilities on your shoulders. Um, and then the third one of those is realizing that um, even though dad doesn't always act like the adult, he's still the adult. And teaching them that they can't use his injury for an escape. Um, having a dad that has short-term memory loss is perfect for a teenager. Um, it is great. It is, it is wonderful. We had many tales where uh, they'd say, Dad, I told you that. Don't you remember? No, we don't remember because it was never said. And so we also had to teach them the boundaries of not using the injury as excuses. Great, great advice right there. Um, don't use the injury as an excuse. Um, and, and speaking of injuries, I'd like to hear from you, Dave, as the person who has experienced the injury and as the father coming home, what was that like for you in the role as the father um, to have maybe to lean on your children to an extent that you did not well, you know, when I first came home uh, from the hospital, uh, I still did not have prosthetics. Uh, had everything I needed, I needed help with everything. It was like learning how to live all over again. So the kids, they were they were uh, trained real quick <laughs> on uh, how to how to get things and what needed to be done and all that. And, uh, it's uh, you know it. it uh, I look back at it now, and it could have been done so much better with uh, the help of Golden Corral. I think just knowing some of the stuff that we were going to go through and go uh, some of the things we were going to encounter. And back then, there was nothing like the caregiver program, so we didn't have a lot of help from VA. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it just, uh, it, you know, and, and, and I had medications that made me not good to be around. So they learned how to deal with that, and learned how to deal with a very angry man for many years. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that they uh, I grew a little bit from having to deal with that early on and um, uh, were better in their relations with other people when they could see how bad things could get, you know. And, uh, so uh, they were 
struggling a little bit uh, more than the average child, I think, on that side of stuff. Definitely, I would say challenging would be an appropriate word to use. It sounds like um, each of you. Uh, what, what would you say some of the biggest challenges facing our military-connected children are these days? I'll start with the military-connected children. What are some of the, the largest challenges, um, but especially for those who are uh, living in a household where there is a disabled service member or veteran? So, um, from my end, I definitely think it goes back to that figuring out where your boundaries are. Um, kind of along with that, joking, like the personal boundaries in our house, um, we have two code words now. We have TBI boy and we have Hulk. <laughs> Um, and so whenever he goes into those moments, we can be like, okay, Hulk, calm down. And he'll kind of get a laugh out of him, and it reminds him to, to calm back down and come back down. And, um, so that's a huge thing. Um, but like we mentioned earlier, too, just being vulnerable. Um, unfortunately, I'm sorry if I get emotional. Um, I had a really, really good friend who was a child of a service member who had a brain injury. And he felt like a burden on his family. Sorry. Um, because he thought that he was one more person that his mom had to take care of. And um, as a result of that, he committed suicide at the age of 15, 16. Um, and so that was really the moment for me whenever I was like, okay, this is my chance. I have to be the vulnerable one. And I have to put my story out there so that other kids my age know that they're not alone so that that doesn't happen anymore. And unfortunately, that still happened. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. <laughs> don't, don't um, but I think getting kids to open up, especially teenagers, kids, I mean, who likes to deal with a teenager? I don't like to deal with myself whenever I was a teenager. <laughs> um, but to know that you're not alone is such a huge thing. And so being vulnerable and being out there and open and just being honest with everybody in the world is a huge challenge. Um, but it's also the best thing that I, I could do because whenever I opened up, suddenly I realized that I wasn't alone because other people were coming to me and saying, I'm here for you. I know what you've been through. Like, thank you for doing this for me. And then we were able to be a team and be like, oh, well, this is what my family does. Why don't you try this? Or, oh, here's what my family does. I can apply that. Um, a quick example of that was whenever my dad was first diagnosed, we used um, weather to help her as a five-year-old understand these days. So we had sunny days, we had cloudy days, and we had stormy days. And I had a friend, um, I think two or three years ago, um, that I ran into while I was at college, and they were telling me about what they were going through and having a younger sibling, and I was like, oh, well, here's what we use, and you don't have to be a kid to understand that, but it puts it in layman's terms. So just being open and honest, it can be such a challenge, but it can also be a huge blessing. Absolutely. And, and, and I, first of all, thank you for being open and honest and vulnerable right now because I think that what you just said and what you shared with us is, um, it resonates. And I think it resonates to each and every one of us because we all want that connection, right? We are wired for that connection. And we know that the research is there that Connection is one of the pillars of resilience. And so in order to really truly be resilient and to be strong, we have to be connected. And sometimes that takes being vulnerable. So thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that with us. Um, Amy, did you want to add something? I was just going to say um, another one where you may be best to say something about this. But another challenge that we have, you mentioned one-year-old and five-year-old, seven-year-old. Clara was five. These children are living with the ramifications of something they don't even really remember anymore either. Um, Clara has very few memories of her dad actually in service. He was gone for the entire first three years of her life. Um, and then she remembers recovery. So she has very few memories of military quote unquote lifestyle. She'll tell you, Clara, what's your, what's your favorite thing about being a military kid? Um, I joke it's the military screwed me over because I didn't get to travel anywhere. Um, I literally moved from one end of Jacksonville, North Carolina to the other end. Very boring. Um, I wish I got to travel more with the military, but I was joking they screwed me over on that part. Yeah, because 
think that she's a military kid, expected to be a military kid because everybody sees her father and her injuries. And so it's a challenge because she doesn't know exactly where she fits in. And we have a lot of kids now that are, you know, older and their father's injuries or their parents, excuse me, their parents' injuries. I didn't need to be specific there. Their parents' injuries were whenever they were so young, but they're still expected to have all of those things of a military child. And that's a huge challenge too, you know, whenever you don't remember the actual lifestyle, but you're living with the ramifications. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that, because that is, that's a very good point there, is that some of these children don't know the before, right? There is a before and the after, but not all of them know the before. Um, so there's that sense of an identity whenever, you know, oh, your, your parent, um, you know, thank you for your service, and your parent was injured in support of our nation, but they don't understand who the parent was that went into that service. Um, so that's a very good point, a very good reminder. And we have talked a lot about the challenges, and we've talked a lot about, you know, these obstacles that families have to overcome and the children as caregivers have to overcome. There's a lot of really good stuff that happens being a part of the military connected family too. So I'd love to hear about that too. So let's talk about some of the, the triumphs. <coughs> We've talked a little bit about Isabella, like finding that sense of strength inside of you. So Claire, what would you say one of the triumphs, one of the great things about being a military connected child would be? I think I'd have to say is um, a little bit of the growing up part of it. So you learn to be very responsible very fast. And it comes in handy a lot whenever you are caring for your parent. And so I think that as you get older, obviously you want to be responsible. And the fact that you can learn that at such a young age, I don't think it's a downfall that, oh, you had to grow up too fast. You're so responsible. I think it is, wow, look at you. Like, look at what you did. You. Um, stepped up and you're helping taking care of your parent, look how responsible you became. Not as a bad thing, but as a uh, as a triumph, as a as a way to show what you've gone through and how much you've overcome. Right. And I'm sure it, it, it kind of gives you a boost of self-confidence. Like, I've gotten through this, I've taken this on, I know that because of that strength, I can use that strength and apply in other areas. Did you have something like that? Um, just another, like, try to, uh, something good. So, I grew up knowing the military lifestyle, and while we didn't know a lot, we had friends that came and went a lot. Um, and so you'll hear us talk about our brother all the time. And with that, um, we have so many extended family, and it's because of the military. They're not truly, you know, blood-related, but that's our family. So, like, our, our brother, um, Friends of friends knew him, and everyone's kind of known. We don't do formal holidays in our house. Everything is super chill, come and go. Um, that's kind of been a result of my dad's injury, so that he could step back if he needed to, or be there whenever he was ready. And so somebody was like, oh, hey, the Tafts, you know, have Thanksgiving or Easter, I think it was. And he was like, oh, I don't want to intrude. And they're like, no, seriously, they tell us. If we don't show up with somebody they don't know, we're not doing it right. Um, and so he showed up to our house, and the joke is that we fed him, and he never left. <laughs> um, he's a Marine, so we fed yes. him, and that, that's all it took. He never left. <laughs> all right, so I'd like to hear, and we are going to do questions in just a moment, so um, hang tight for a second. So the Rileys, I'd like to hear from y'all with your children. What would you say, um, what are some of the silver linings, what are the, the triumphs that have come from your family's story? Well, I think uh, um, my my kids got a, uh, a exposure to a much wider uh, range of life uh, than the normal child. Uh, I think they're stronger for it. Are you doing a ditto down there? <laughs> All right. So um, we are going to turn this over in just a moment to questions and answers. But before we do that, I'd love to hear from y'all. We opened with, what is one word from the video that resonated with you? Now I'd like to ask you about the 15 things that we saw. What one thing do you think applies to 
your family or to military children as caregivers? Um, so for me, it was the one that said, sometimes we don't want to talk about it. And it, it's the truth. I mean, sometimes I don't want to talk about it. And so my mom was very patient with me, and she waited for me to come to her. So that was a huge one, that you can't always force it out, and sometimes trying to force it out can make it worse. Such a big thing that, um, I mean, it, it's complicated. We're struggling too, and sometimes we just can't find the words to, to go to someone and say. So it's easier just to sit and think about what you're doing, what's happening, and um, not speaking at all to anyone about it. It's just sometimes you don't want to talk about it, you know? <laughs> and, and I love what you're saying because what, what you've just heard is something that we hear a lot at Camp Corral is they go to this camp with other children who have some of the similar lived experiences, but that doesn't mean that they spend the whole week there talking about it. Many times they don't even talk about it. They just do kid things. They just get out there, they have a great time, they are living their best life, having adventures, um, and they don't have to feel like they have to talk about it. They're just with people who understand and get it. So I, I hear that a lot. Uh, from a lot of, of the children that we serve. Amy, what about you? We're just like every other family. That's the one that resonates with me. We have a couple of struggles, but other than that, we're, we're just like any other family. Riley? I think uh, resiliency kind of jump, jumps to the forefront, being able to bounce back uh, from uh, extreme challenges and uh, being able to deal with them. Okay. All right, so we do, we have all of these, this list, and once again, this list was compiled from a, about 2,000 children who gave us their responses, and I think that that is very indicative of what this community of children who are caregivers, these children who are at home and providing care to uh, their parents, their guardians who have been injured or ill through their service to our nation. I would at this time like to invite you to ask questions of our panelists, to make comments. Um, anything that you would like to add to the conversation, please feel free to step up to the podium. If you can't make it up to the podium, let us know. We'll get a microphone to you, okay? Yes, sir. 